song was a request for us. Y'all sing along if you know it. I've heard them sing he paid the price and Jesus bore it all. I've heard them sing I'm coming home and hear the master's call. I've heard them sing the modern songs and songs of long ago. That amazing grace, how sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. How sweet, how sweet the sound. No sweeter song, no sweeter song in this life could be found. I've heard a found where sinners wash their wash white as snow. But amazing grace, how sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. I've heard them sing, he paid the price in just a little while. I've heard them John Monk had been requesting this. I don't see him there, so I want to send it out to him. Maybe you go back on Facebook and listen. It's a song I wrote on my first album, New Wine. <coughs> I've heard 
old habits they're so hard to break that man he seems to fail every time my life was in shambles I thought that I would die Till someone introduced me To a new taste of wine Drinking on new wine Been living on new time There's nothing like the sweet Holy Ghost If I could rewind and turn back the hands of time then I would get stone on his love If I could rewind and turn back the hands of time, then I would get stoned on his love. As for you, Mr. John.
old-time hymn song. Well, I'm happy night and day as I journey through this land. I've been mighty blessed of God and I'm holding to his hand. The journey's almost over and the victory's almost won. And I have a feeling in my heart that the best is yet to come. Oh, the best is yet to come when I walk into heaven's gates. The first time I see Jesus, I can hardly wait. He'll show me to my mansion and says this is your home. And I have a feeling in my heart that the best is yet to come. Well, I'm standing now on Jordan's bank as I face life's rolling tide. Them storms of life, they're raging, but I'm happy down inside. I can see the lifeboat coming to take us safely home. And I have a feeling in my heart that the best is yet to come. How about you, church? Well, the best is yet to come when I walk into heaven's gates. For the first time I see Jesus, I can hardly wait. He'll show me to my mansion and says this is your home. And I have a feeling in my heart that the best is yet to come. Standing now on Jordan's bank as I face life rolling tides. Storm and life is raging, but I'm feeling good inside. Oh, I see the lifeboat coming to take us safely home. And I have a feeling in my heart that the best is yet to come. Oh, the best is yet to come when I walk into heaven's gates. The first time I see Jesus. I can hardly wait. He'll show me to my mansion and say that it is your home. And I have a feeling in my heart that the best is yet to come. Yeah, I have a feeling in my heart that the best is yet to come. All right, if I can get my ushers to come around this morning. I'm going to take up tithes and offerings. Say thank you for your giving. People, man, are still giving to the chairs. We want to say Hallelujah. thank you for that. So it all goes back into the building fund. We hope to be through this thing for this this thing, this house of the Lord, before much longer. My hope and prayers is. All right, let's all stand over the building one more time. I know you just sit down, but you get to your pocketbook a little better when you stand up. So obey the Lord in your tithes and offering in your building fund as well. Bow our head this morning. Just want to say thank you once again for your giving. I'm going to ask Patrick back there, if he would, that bless the tithes and offering building funds. They come around and receive them for the Lord. Well, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He touched my body. He healed my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Each day is just the same. Go on and praise him. Church. 
Just look what the Lord has done. He touched my body. He healed my mind. Yes, he saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Each day is just the same. Go on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. I got any praisers in the house? This time, my third grade, and yes, ma'am. All right, next Saturday. Yep. It's on the announcement list, too, Wayne. You asked me. <laughs> third grade and under, who's my teacher this morning? Miss Lauren and Robin. Y'all give them a hand for what they're doing for the Lord. Fourth grade to seniors, or twelfth grade, Mr. Stephen and Miss Jessica, I'll give them a hand for what they're doing for the Lord. <laughs> and for those that are going to stay with me, if you have your Bibles, grab your Bibles and go to the book of St. Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 to the end of the chapter. St. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Very familiar scriptures. I preach on the storm, but I've, I, don't th I don't think I've ever had a passage of scripture just jump out at me like this one did this past week, just reading. I want to reveal a little bit of something different than what we normally used to, or I've never heard it preached on, never really. I don't even know how, to, how you would start studying on something like this, but I've just been praying it down and Asking the Lord to give me favor, because out his favor, we can all go home. But with his favor, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. When you find it, say amen. amen. And the same day, when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into that ship so that it was now full. I want you to pay attention to that verse of Scripture right there. Now, put yourself in their position. You're on the sea, and the storm has, has raged and blew the winds and blew the waves into your boat that you're traveling in. And the Bible said that it was now full. Now, that word can be very uh, tricky. Because a lot of people is uh, got a gas tank in their vehicle. And you could say it's full. And that would sound good unless it was half full or quarter full. So I, I believe that the, the scripture is telling us that it's filling. I don't really believe it's full. 
because if it's full, then Jesus would be drowned because he's in the boat sleeping. So I believe that the water is piling into the boat. I believe it's something that is just it, it's, it's filled with fear. That, that water is in the boat. I, I, I just got to, I got to stop on verse 37 for a second. Make sure you get it. Because I have read over this past scripture over and over and over and over and over. But water, somebody say water's in the boat. Anytime you're in a boat and water's in your boat, that ain't good. Especially if you don't know how to swim. That's really bad. But now watch. Watch this. 38 to 41. You don't hear nothing else about the water. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How many knows it's not good to wake Jesus up from a nap? He's ill. I know y'all ain't never seen Jesus ill, but he's angry right here. Why y'all wake me up for you? No faith. He could have said little faith. At least they did have enough faith to go wake him up. He's like, you guys have no. Where's your faith at? And then verse 41 says, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another. What happened to the water, man? That, that ain't what it said, though, is it? No, it said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea Obey him. How, now, my question is, before we get into the word today, my question is to you that jumped out of the pages to me, because I don't know how many times I've read this pastor's scripture. I don't know time, how many times I've heard it preached. But if the water was such the problem, where'd it go to? It's not even worth mentioning in the final closing of this story. He leaves this story and goes to another uh, island and don't even talk about the thing that was bothering them the most ain't even worth mentioning. I'm going to say it my daddy's turn before I go to prayer. My daddy used to tell me when something bothered me real bad, a week to ten days, son, you won't ever know it happened. Yeah. Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, that you are so powerful that whatever's bothering us this morning that seems so bad, I mean, it's life-threatening. We're not going to make it. God, you care not that we perish Wake up. Do you not care what we're going through? Then all of a sudden, you wake up and teach us that what was so bad, it, it really wasn't as bad as we thought it was. Father, I pray today, Lord, for unction, Lord, to be able to just pour out my heart what you've poured inside of it, God. And I pray for the abundance of my heart, my mouth to speak. My heart may be filled with love, and Lord, you'll get all the praise and glory. Father, we bind Satan right now in the name of Jesus. I know he'd have every, every pleasure just to ruin a good service. But Lord, your people's gathered here, and you promised in your word, where two or three's gathered in your name, that you are here in the midst. And so, Father, I pray that preaching will become easy with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. Let's love on Jesus. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. If I had a title, and I really don't have one, so I don't want to box God up. This story just jumped out at me this week in my reading as I was reading. But if I had anything to title this, I would ask you the question, what are you full of today? What are you full of? Well, if, as we know this story that we've heard so often that Jesus is in the boat this time, the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, you'll, you'll see these same stories talked about. In different perspectives, different writers look at it different ways, but the same God that's anointing the story to pen these scriptures that we read about today in the Bible. And so we find out that Jesus is on the vessel with him. And I don't know about y'all, but to me, that's the main event. My, my son was talking with somebody yesterday, and he began to tell him, so I don't, I don't have to stay in the big boy church because I know what daddy's going to preach about. And I normally I discuss my lessons. I said, oh, yeah, big boy, what am I going to preach about this Sunday? He said, Jesus. <laughs> I thought to myself, I'm glad that my son knows that I preach about Jesus because I couldn't think of a better person to preach about. How about y'all? How many is glad to hear the name of Jesus? Amen. So the first thing I'd like to ask you, is Jesus in your boat? Amen. Is Jesus riding with you? Are you taking him where you go 
Are you going where he tells you to go? Because if Jesus is on board with you, then when we get to the other side, everything's going to be all right. Amen. I didn't say it was going to be all right through to the other side, but once we get through, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But the very first thing that I want to mention that's in this scripture, because Jesus pulls the curtains back of what real life looks like even when he's in the boat. Sometimes we've made this story in our mind that we think that because we've asked Christ to come into our heart or he's riding with us now and he's on board with us now that we're exempt from storms. But, but church, I want to be very clear today that just because you're a Christian don't mean you're not going to go through some storms. Can I get a witness today? That's the very first point I want to make that none of us are exempt from storms. I say none of us because some people make their decisions to follow Christ on what the weather looks like. And because the weather looks sunshiny today, I'll follow Christ. But I want to warn you that this, the sunshiny weather won't always stay sunshiny, that there's a few rainstorms in the forecast. There's a few rainstorms in your future. But in the midst of them storms, make sure you keep Jesus on board because he walks on water. You might just need him. Matthew chapter 5 verse 45 says, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. I love that scripture because that scripture teaches me that I'm not exempt from hurting just like a lost person exempt from hurting. Just because I have faith doesn't mean that I'm not going to go through some storms. Because Jesus has got all the faith in the world and he laid down in the midst of his storm. I don't know about y'all. I can't stop storms from coming. But I'm thankful that greater is he that is inside of me than he that's in this world that can rise up when I can't take no more. And he can speak to the winds of my life that keeps rocking my boat back and forth and say, Peace, be still. Somebody say, Be still. Some of us always liking to move, but sometimes you just got to know God when you're still. Amen. Acts chapter 14 verse 22 says, Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Somebody shout continue. And that we must through much tribulation. That, that's a powerful scripture there. Who's he talking to? He's talking about those that continue in the faith through much trouble, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. You will not make it to the other side without going through some trouble. I wish I had somebody to help me preach today. I don't know what you came to church for. Maybe you come to church to hear the choir music and look pretty and see who you're going to see. But church, we're in the middle of a storm. If you've not walked outside, the United States of America is in the midst of a storm. And it's time that somebody with faith stand up and say church hold on we're going to make it to the other side don't give up hope the blessed is the man that waits upon the Lord amen we're going through storms we're not exempt from storms well if you had such great faith Mr. Preacher man why does this happen in our lives faith doesn't exempt you from things happening in your life and so, so many people may come to the conclusion, well, if I've got to go through stuff, why should I let Jesus get on boat with me? <laughs> Psalm 34, 19 clarifies that, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but, somebody shout, but. But the Lord delivered him out of them all. Miss Linda said one of Mr. Randy's favorite words was, but God. That's why I got him on board with me. He never told me that I wouldn't go through something, but what he did tell me that I was going to go all the way through. I wasn't going to get stuck in the middle of a storm. How many has ever felt stuck in their walk with God? You ever feel like that? That you're rowing as hard as you can, but the wind keeps knocking you back. Yeah, real folks will admit that today that real life comes with some storms, man. Real life comes with such storms, sometimes you want to quit rowing. Yeah, that's what the disciples done did. They had done rowed. And I want to reiterate to you today that these people on this boat, they knew what they were doing on the sea. Or at least they thought they did. 
These were fishermen. They were skilled on the water. They wasn't just some Johnny-come-lately man on a bass boat that just went and spent $50,000 to go wet their hook. And no, 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 these people did this for a living. This was their territory. They knew how to deal with the storms. But how many has ever went out on something that you thought you knew how to deal with only to find out you didn't, you weren't as good as dealing with what you thought was coming as you thought you were, and you had to go wake Jesus up? I believe Jesus is teaching us today that we need him awake all points of our life. We don't need to wait till a storm comes before we get a hold of the Lord. We ought to get a hold to him when the sun's out. Give him glory. Give him praise. Thank him for waking you up in your right mind. I'm grateful for the people who come here that's in a storm. They're in trouble. I'm here to let you know that I'm in the same storm as you are. We all looking for Jesus. We all trying to get him to move in our life. But the fact is today that we don't need to wait till a storm comes before we get a hope to him. That when he does bring you through, his, through the storm that you're going through, don't turn around and put him back on a shelf and wait till you get back into a storm before you need him again. I'm preaching, but ain't nobody helping me. You know that's the truth today. You see all kind of people come running to the church when they go through a storm, and then Jesus brings them through their storm, and the first thing they do is put him back on the shelf of do nothing in my life till I need you again. I holler at you when I need you again. And the merciful Savior that we serve most of the time will come off the shelf and do it again. You better be glad I'm not Jesus. I wouldn't do that for you. You set me on a shelf, you can forget me. I won't never help you again in my life. Aren't you glad Brandon's not Jesus? I am because I do my own self like that sometimes. But the high standard that God calls for, he still loves his people. Still loves them. And if you're here today and you come and you say, Pastor, I'm in the worst storm of my life. I don't know how to get out of it. I'm telling you right now, you better get a hold of Jesus. He's your only help. He's the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except it be through him. Somebody say amen. amen. But I want you to get it through your thick, hard-headed skull today. And maybe I'm talking to myself. I'm not talking to you. But somehow or another, I feel like when I got saved that I deserved a reward. Maybe I'm just thinking to myself, now, Lord, I'm saved now. I'm your child. You want me to reward my children? Amen. You want me to praise my children? You want me to lift my children up? You want me to encourage my children? So I'm looking for you to encourage me. And he says, I'm looking to, I'm looking to encourage you, but I just want to let you know that just like your children, just because you love your children, don't exempt them from the bully picking on them at school. Now, you may try to go out there and take care of business, but I'm telling you, it won't stop a bully in the future from picking on your kid. Can I get an amen today? Kids sometimes are mean. Sometimes they mistreat one another at school, but it don't stop mom and daddy from loving their baby. God's trying to tell me today to tell the church today, quit getting so upset when storms come your way. Welcome storms when they come and give God the highest praise that you can, knowing that this storm can't stop me from going to the other side. Do you not know who I got on my boat? I got the God that created water riding with me. And I know it may be getting me down, but it can't. Look at him. He ain't asleep. Somebody shout peace. Yeah, he's the prince of peace. He's in there. Uh, that same way my mama, she'll call me sometime because when bad weather comes, it comes from over there around Chatham and and, and, and state line and all up through there where she lives at. And she'll call me, son, you, uh, you, you better watch out. It's going to get bad tonight. Dad will go to Texas. Watch out the bad weather. And I'll be asleep won't get it to the next day. <laughs> Was it rough around your house? I don't know. I don't know because I slept right through. I used to be scared to death of bad weather. But if you put me at home and I know I got my name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, it may blow me away in the middle of the night, but I know where I'm going to wake up at tomorrow. Somebody say amen. Now, I'm not saying I'm not human because we're going to get to that second point that I really feel like needs to be preached nowadays. But I'm not only human. We hear this song, I'm only human. I'm just a woman. I'm not only human and I'm not I'm definitely not a woman. <laughs> now I'm sorry if that's your favorite song. I love it one day at a time. Sweet Jesus. It's good, but it's not all true. If you're born again, you're not only human. That's why the storm scares you to death because you think that you're only human. 
And I don't want to tell you that you're Jesus Jr. by no means, but you are of the royal family. And I want to let you know that my father is not a child forsaker. If he put his stamp of approval on you by giving you the great Holy Ghost, he's got you in the midst of your storm. He's got a stamp on your forehead to let you know that that's mine. Somebody say, that's mine. Yeah, that's mine. I won't ever forget the time that my kids were playing basketball. And if you don't know anything about my wife, they they little on the, oh, what's the proper word to say? Crazy side? <laughs> Maybe I went a little too far with that, but I was trying to be nice. But anyhow, <laughs> we had a game, and, and you think she's crazy. You ought to meet some of her kinfolk. Come on. We, 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 we had a basketball game with, with a middle petition that, that my girl's playing on one side, my boy's playing on the other side, and her sister's over there watching, I think it was my son, while she's over, my wife's watching her, my daughter, and all of a sudden a little boy trips my boy up. You know, they're just playing ball. They're just playing ball, and all of a sudden they get tangled up again and get pushed, and whoo, her sister says, you going to let that happen, Brandon? I'm like, what, they're just playing ball. The second push, next thing I know, she goes over to get my wife, and here goes my wife out on the court. Now, there's two things that my wife protects. That's her darling and her kids. She will go out on the court, even though she's pastor's wife, and say, that's mine. How many is grateful for the mamas and daddies that go out and say, don't fool with mine, that's mine. If you think you're good... How much more do you think your heavenly father will step in when the enemy comes in like a flood and lift up a standard and say, don't mess with that child. He's mine. Somebody give God praise today. He come in one day and say, devil, he's mine. He's mine. God protects what's his. But it doesn't mean you're going to be exempt from the storm. Sometimes I believe he allows us to ride through storms just to let everybody know around him, he's mine. I mean, because the Bible said that there was other little ships behind him, but Jesus wasn't on those other little ships. Yeah, and the just and the unjust had to ride through the same storm, but the difference maker is that Jesus is on board. I don't know how blessed my life. My, my life has not been easy. My life has probably been even more hard. I thought my pastor, to be honest with you, when I first come to full gospel, I thought he was a liar. I'm honest with you. And I know he listens to the sermons, but he come up there, and it was two or three guys that come in at the same time, and he told me, he said, these kids, these young guys, they're going to see how much better life is since they've come to know the Lord. And I thought to myself, I must not know the Lord because my life ain't getting better. It's getting worse. Can I get an amen? Anybody ever served the Lord and life got worse besides getting better? But one thing that I've really been blessed about to know what he was trying to say is that life might not get better. But if Jesus is on board with me, I'm going all the way to the other side. First Peter chapter four, verse 12 says, beloved, I think it not beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. What a word to use fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. I don't know how many people I've had to counsel that came to me and told me, Pastor, I'm about ready to give up. Pastor, I done got discouraged. Pastor, I don't understand where God's at. Everything, everything I do for the Lord, everything I try to do for the Lord just seems like it get worse. And I just don't understand. Pastor, I'm losing faith. I'm about to quit because you got your faith in what's going on and not in who he is. You got to talk to yourself and say, so I know whom I have believed in. And it don't make no difference what I have to go through through if God be for me who can be against me and I'm so thankful that even though the water's trying to fill my boat I know my vessel is already filled with Jesus so I'm going to lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and look unto Jesus look unto Jesus who's the author and finisher of my faith now second part I want to talk about that a lot of people's not talking about this here of lately because church folk deal with this too we don't we don't want to act like we deal with it but we deal with anxiety now a lot of faith people are like no child i got so much faith don't nothing bother me i'm in the name of jesus i'm this you feel with lying now and that's the church's biggest problem we've learned to call faith a liar we've replaced faith with a lie 
And so everybody's intimidated to walk in church because we act as if we never are afraid of the storm. Not since Jesus come on board, I'm, I got it going on. Well, Jesus is on board with them, and they don't have it going on. <laughs> Boy, I'm, I'm trying to help somebody because the churches just don't want to get honest with herself no more. We don't, we don't deal with anxiety, Pastor. You know, be anxious for nothing. You know why Jesus told us not to be anxious for nothing? Because he knew we were anxious. God never tells us not to do something that we're already not doing. Don't eat of the fruit. Yeah, I'm going to eat of it. The word anxiety means a feeling of worry or nervousness or unease, typically about an imminent or something's about to happen or event or something, the uncertain outcome. And so that's what's going on. The water is filling the boat. And the water's filling the boat, so they have to go get some help. They're anxious about what? They're anxious about the water taking them under. How many has ever felt some heavy stuff come against them about to take them under? And you're even anxious about it. you got this uneasy feeling about you. You wake up with bad thoughts in your mind that, man, I'm not going to make it. This thing's going to take me under. And God allowed these scriptures to be pointed to us to let us know what real life looks like even when Christ is in your heart. Even when Christ is on your vessel. Still deal with anxiety, man. What would it be like if the church would open up and talk about our fears and our insecurities? May not be so much suicide. Amen. Amen. May not be so much counseling going on that we have to run to a counselor to, to put us to sleep or put us on a nerve pill. If we was to talk about it, I share with you some, some real life uh, testimonies that uh, I, you know, most of you know I run a recovery program here and it's been open for years. And one, one night in particular, and some of y'all know who it was, and I, I'm not going to say no names, but I've always been a cocky preacher. I just believe in living right. And if it's in the book, we need to say it. But God can bring that cockiness down to a level of love by letting you walk through some of the same storms they do. And so this lady came one night and she we was preaching on forgiveness and she was quick to let me know she would not forgive, that I had no idea what she was walking through. And when she said that, boy, I was about to go off because she's got the whole congregation in there uh, telling them, you know, we don't have to forgive. You know, I'm not going to forgive. You don't, And I was just fisting and go off. And I was listening to the Lord because, believe it or not, I have to hear what I say up here. If I don't hear from the Lord, I don't have nothing to say. And so I said, Lord, what do I say? And nothing came to my mind. I said, Lord, I've got to address this. What do I say? I ain't heard nothing. He said, if you ain't heard nothing, don't say nothing. I said, what kind of preacher am I not saying nothing? I got to straighten this up. And before that lady left the service that night, she was talking about trying to forgive. She was feeling better. And the Lord began to show me sometimes we don't have to be quick to lash out at people. When they talk about their insecurities, they get it out of them. But not the church of our age. We'd rather go home making everybody look like we're tough when we're scared of our own shadow. I ain't scared of nothing, blessed Lord. I'm saved. I got my name in the Lamb Book of Life. I ain't scared of nothing. <laughs> goody, goody for you. You're the only one. The rest of us are scared to death. Come on. Fl Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Paul says this. Be careful for nothing. That means anxious. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. How are you not going to be anxious? Pray about it. And see, to me, that's, that, that's what's going on on the boat while Jesus is so ill. Jesus has taught his disciples what they're doing. They're not doing it. Even though Jesus is God, he's still 100% man here. Amen. And he don't point the deity to him. He always talks about his father. And they hadn't first went to their father. They hadn't even asked their father. He even taught them how to pray. Our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And they've skipped everything that he's taught and coming to him and just, you know, depending on him to do everything. And we do know that Jesus is God. But Jesus is trying to teach a lesson that what I've taught you, you need to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. I love that word. You know what the supplication means? Yeah, I thought so. I didn't know what it meant neither, so don't worry about it. You're not, you're, anyhow, supplication. The word supplication means the act of asking or begging for something. 
I ain't finna beg for nothing. You get in a storm with the intensity of, uh, of this storm, you won't mind begging. I'm telling you today, we ought to be pleading with heaven. We ought to be ringing those prayer bells of heaven. God, have you seen what America has turned into? Have you seen what the church has turned into? If them early saints and them old saints in the 1900 was to see what we've turned the church into, I believe we need to beg just a little bit longer. Amen. Men of God used to have enough integrity and anointing behind the pulpit to call sin out. You don't even hardly hear about sin in church no more. Everybody's going to heaven, bless the Lord. No matter how we live, just as long as we got Jesus in the boat. <laughs> Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Everything bothers you. Anything that makes you feel uneasy, you ought to be begging and praying to God to get rid of it. How many knows that God don't want us to live in anxiety? There's a scripture that I've always thought was amazing. In the book of Revelation, he talks about the people that won't make it. And you know, we hear about the drunkard and the, you know, the whoremonger and the liar and the adulterer and all this, that, and other. But a lot of people don't want to talk about one of the people didn't make it was fearful. Go back and read it. It's in the book of Revelation. The fearful won't make it. And I thought to myself, my God, as much as I deal with fear, then I, I may not make it, Lord. I deal with fear all the time. I'm just a big old scaredy cat. Can anybody say amen? amen. Yeah. I'm scared half times behind this pulpit wondering why the Lord called me. Because somebody else has got more faith, Lord. But sometimes he calls the weak to confirm the mighty. Sometimes he calls the foolish to confirm the wise. He don't need a smart preacher and, a, and, and one that's tough. He needs somebody weak that he can show his power through because his strength is made what? Perfect in weakness. Amen. Scaredy cat, scaredy cat. Be careful for nothing. Amen. But with all your prayers and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts in mind through Christ Jesus. I don't know about y'all, but the only way I'm going to deal with the anxiety that I have to deal with in my life is to keep praying about it, keep pushing about it, keep facing your giants, keep looking at your giants, and begin to tell your giants how big your God is. Your giant hadn't heard lately how big your God is. All they're talking about is how big Goliath is, how many fingers he has, how many toes he has, how tall he is, how wide he is. But if the church would start back talking about how big God is and start coming magnifying the Lord together and worshiping him and giving him praise. Amen. Amen. I believe it would start seeing a moving of God in our midst. I thought that supplication word was just outstanding. You need to start learning to beg God for the things that you go through in your life. Plead with him. The old timers used to talk about praying through, grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar, and don't turn it loose until something happens. We pray too, but very, very few times we pray through. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 34. Take therefore, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Can I tell you something that really aggravates me? Probably aggravates some of y'all. That every time I ride by the, the, the Murphy's gas station. That aggravates me. It frustrates me to no end that I've had a budget of groceries for years. And then my wife said, it just won't make it no more, Brandon. And the thing about it is that this upcoming year, people will vote for people that makes it like that. That aggravates me. But at the end of the day, it doesn't bother me one single bit. When I go to sleep, man, you have to wake me up with a bulldozer because I know that my money doesn't come from the White House. My money doesn't come from your house. Come on, that's why I can preach gun barrel straight because my money don't come from you. I thank you for your tithes and offerings and everything that you give, but my money comes from the Lord. God has looked after me too many years, and I'm not going to go to seeking after money now. We're seeking after God. Come on, somebody help me preach this. Day. I'm not going to worry about where my meal's coming from. I got people bringing eggs in left and right. If I have to live off of egg sandwiches every day, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And that's the way the church needs to be. I believe that the government is toying with us because they see the fear that it's putting in our eyes. 
We're going to give them a little bit more. They scared. Going to give them a little bit more. They scared. Wonder what they think about when somebody stands up and say, hit me with your best shot. Throw me in the fire if you want to, but I'm coming out. Put me in your den of lions. I want to show you who owns the den. Put me where you want to. Shut me up. They, they, they lock you up on Facebook nowadays for the way you preach. They, they just bypass this one. They don't ever lock this one up. I talk about them all the time. Amen. Amen. Half times we got the SARS government there's ever been. Anytime they'll put a homosexual on our main line to fight for our country, that's the SARS government that we've ever had. Turn me off. Lock me out. I don't care. It's time for somebody to stand up and tell them quit killing babies is wrong. Marrying men and men is wrong. Marrying women and women is wrong. What happened to standing for the truth? Well, that offends me, Pastor. Get offended and get over it. Same britches you put your legs into, get over it. Because wrong is wrong. I don't care if I'm doing it. Amen. It's time for us to stand up and say, I'm not worried about what they're doing because no matter how hard I pray, I've done read the end of the book. You think it's bad now. Just hold on. No matter how hard I pray, it ain't going to change this world. God's already told me what it's going to look like when he's coming back. He told me this is the beginning of sorrows. So everybody's in the prayer calling, Lord, change our government, Lord. Man, they got dead folks voting. How crooked can you get? Amen. Boy, it gets quiet when you start talking politics. Somebody got to say something about it. It ain't politics. It's pure demons is what it is. Our country, this one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. What happened? I tell you what happened. The church shut up because we were scared to offend anybody. We didn't want to make anybody mad. We wanted everybody to be welcome. Everybody's not going to be welcomed in heaven. Might as well go on and start that now. Amen. Everybody's worrying about where they're going to get the food from. Well, I want to be politically correct. I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. Who cares about somebody's feelings, man? The truth is what's going to raise our kids, our grandkids. I don't know, man. Churches all around, they're drying up. They're dying because there's too many lukewarm preachers in the preacher, in the pulpit, trying to tell people what they want to hear, heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears, tell them what they want to hear because they want another George Washington. They want another Benjamin Franklin in their pocket. But sometimes we got to stand up and tell the people the truth that what was wrong back then, it's still wrong today. Well, who he think he is? He did think he perfect. Get so tired of hearing that junk. Open up your Bible and read. There's a lot of stuff ain't going to heaven. Shoot me and call me a crazy preacher. Never come back and see me. I don't care. But I'm telling you, I want you to know the truth. Because only the truth going to make you free. We don't hear it preached no more. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Only few be there which find it. No, we don't hear that. That fends people, preacher. I had an atheist tell me one day, in my own yard. <laughs> he said, what was he doing there? It was a man, too. He says, the uh, re reason I don't like Christianity because it's so narrow. And I told him real quick, like, he was in the wrong yard. I said, yep, that's the only way Christianity is ever going to be is narrow. He said, y'all too narrow-minded. I said, that's the way Jesus said, straight at the gate, and narrow is the way. But at least, listen to me, at least he had enough integrity, even as an atheist, to say if I, don't, if I don't agree with him, I won't live for him. Because nowadays we got church people that signing their names in the Lamb's Book of Life that don't want to go by what Jesus had to say. And Jesus even made the comment, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say to do? Churches is filled with them. Are you on your way to heaven? Yeah, I went to the altar. I said a sinner's prayer. I got baptized. What's your life look like? Full of garbage. Come on. Full of garbage because nobody's perfect. Nobody lives any better. But Jesus set the record straight that he that's in Christ is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have. Quit worrying about these silly things. Verse 33 but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, 
For the mar shall take thought for the things of itself. Oh, brother. Even churches are preaching. Oh, brother, you better pray for this upcoming election. It could just, just, it, it, it just, uh, it's our whole destiny on the line. <laughs> Your destiny is on the line by what president goes into the office? My Lord. You ain't got much of a destiny. I, I don't I don't want another president like we got right now. I'm just going to be honest with you and shoot me if you don't like that. I'm sorry. But if he goes back in, it's not going it's not. Yeah, it will affect us until some degree with the Murphy's gas station, and the gro grocery price. And that's proven to be true. Somebody say amen. amen. But <laughs> my, my my cabinet, every time I go, just got much of just food as in it was any other president. Because my my income don't fluctuate around what they do in the White House or the Oval Office. The Bible said if I pay my tithes, he's promised me. The writer even said I once was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I ain't never been rich. Probably won't never be rich. If there's always somebody to help, I want to help them. But one thing about it, I ain't starving today. That's one anxiety that I refuse to have even though it's all around me. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 10 says, But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that you had suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Amen. That's what's going to take us out of here, church. John chapter 14 verse 27, dealing with anxiety. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Do you know what Satan's lying to the world about? Drugs. Come on, take this. You'll feel good. And he's, you know, that's Satan's. He's a master at that. He uses half the truth. But a half a truth is a lie. Oh, take this. You'll feel better. And that's half the truth because you will. Boy, it lights you up. It'll get you to feeling good, bulletproof, 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Have you ever seen somebody, just be honest with me today, have you ever seen somebody that wouldn't talk to you about their feelings till they got drunk or high? And then they love you. I love you. I love you so much, man. I love you so much, man. You my best friend. <laughs> they get sober, they don't even talk. Much less like that. How much you love me? Yeah, man, you my friend, dog. We're gonna, we, you ride or die. You my, you my dog. Okay. And see, that's not them. Come on. That's not them. And over the years, we've turned our backs upon them because of the drug that's talking through them. And some, I'm trying to help some of you family members out because I don't know how many families up in here, but I'm just about willing to bet you if I was a betting person that there's not many families in here that hadn't been having to deal with some type of drug addiction in their family. If you're there, say amen today. <laughs> drugs are killing America. Not only illegal drugs, but regular drugs are killing America. Because them, you know, we sit back and talk about the illegal drugs while we're high as a kite. On what my doctor said I got a hair come out. You know, my toe, that joke was all messed up. And <laughs> hey, I'm not finna try to trip on your pills, but the best pill I've ever took was the gospel pill. You can take it and stay in your right mind. It'll take you as high as you want to take you. It'll bring you out, won't leave you low. Come on, somebody help me preach about the peace of God that I don't even understand. I don't understand how that the water that scares me so bad that's in my boat. I don't see how I hadn't lost my mind. I should be lost my mind. I should be in a nervous hospital. I should be strapped down. But by the power of God, he came by and stopped the thing that was beating upon me. And I don't even talk about the water no more. All I talk about is the man who calmed the sea and calmed the winds of my life and said, Peace, be still. Somebody shout, Jesus. 
I got to move on. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John chapter 14, verse 1 says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. I'm trying to tie this thing together. There's some good stuff in, in this message. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto my Myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, ending this message today, what in the world is going to get me to the other side? It's your faith. And that's why Jesus is so angry. Because so many people say, well, if I saw a bunch of miracles, then I probably could pray for the sick people then and they'd be healed. That's not going to help you one bit. You can see all the dead people raised. You can see all the born-again Christians live the holy life. You can see whatever you want to see, but I must remind you that there were Pharisees, scribes, and hypocrites that were seeing everything that Jesus did, and it didn't cause them to believe. Matter of fact, they, they're the ones that gave Jesus the hardest struggle. It wasn't the sinner boys. It wasn't the harlots. It wasn't Rahab. It wasn't the drunkards. It wasn't the, no, 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 Jesus said, come unto me. They all came unto him. It was the religious people that thought they knew it all that Jesus had the biggest problems with. So what is it, preacher? What's going to take me to the other side? Listen, I, I, I want to end this message today by this right here because I asked you the question to start with. If rain falls upon the just and the unjust or the church and the unchurch or the sinner and the saint, if the rain falls on both, then why should I allow Jesus in my boat? That's a good question. If I'm going to have to go through the, what the sinner goes through, then what is the benefit of letting God come into my life? What, what's the benefit of it? And here's the thing. It's all about faith, what you have your faith in. When Jesus rose up in verse number 39, he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? What are you full of today? Back to my, my thought that I was talking about a while ago, and, and you'll see the effects of drugs and alcohol when you hear me preach because a, a lot of times I can't remember what I was going to say but most of the times I'm a scaredy cat and it in the book of Revelation when it comes to talking about the fearful it scares me because I won't make it but God showed me a revelation one day that just because you're afraid don't mean you're fearful it's a difference in having fear and being full of fear My thing is, I'm trying to be empty on fear and full of faith. But that's the biggest struggle of my life. I don't know about y'all. It's the biggest struggle of my life, and I've been through every pill that the doctor offered me years ago, and I've chose to live without pills now for about 15 or 16, 17 years, however long it's been. But either way, on pills, off pills, on dope, off dope, on whatever, off whatever, it doesn't stop the storms from coming. They keep rolling in the forecast week after week after week with Christ, without Christ. Life's just filled with a bunch of storms. So if I know I can't stop the wind and I know I can't stop the forecast, but Jesus didn't wake up complaining about the wind. Jesus woke up complaining about their faith. So I cannot stop the water. Matter of fact, Jesus, I believe, is unconcerned with the water because if he was concerned with it, he would have let everybody know at the end of the chapter and the water got out of the boat because after all, that's what they was afraid of. Oh, my God, Jesus, wake up. There's water in the boat. I have to share this story that my dad had a bass boat coming up that always leaked. He always put a stick in the plug on it. He whittled a stick down and jammed it in there and and uh, we'd be out there fishing, you know, and there'd be water in the boat. And I'm like, oh. And so dad, there was another plug on the inside, and he'd pull the plug out. I've probably told you all this story before. But he'd put the boat up in the air, and we'd go upstream, and the water would run out, and you put the plug back, the, the inside plug back in. And so, believe it or not, he gave me this boat when I turned 18. Can you? He loved me, didn't he? I mean, here, here's your boat. It leaks, but son, here's your boat. You can have it. It's free. Thank you, dad. So the first thing I did was jerk the stick out, went and bought a plug. 
And so I went the first day by myself, I think it was, and I fished down there and caught me a bunch of fish and come out and uh, pulled the plug and no water came out. I said, it's amazing what happens when you buy a plug, you know. And second day, my wife wanted to go. We went under, we caught a bunch of fish, come out, pulled the plug. No water came out of it. Hallelujah, I have fixed this problem. Third day, my wife's sister and her kids wanted to go out with me, and they wanted to go to the sandbar, grill out, tent out, while I take our nephew uh, go, go, go fishing. So he was a little bitty fella. And the boat's got a sign on it that says rated for, I don't know, three or four passengers. And we loaded all of them down. We had like six passengers on there, a tent, a cooler, a grill, everything. I didn't want to make two trips, so we went over there to the sandbar, dropped them off. Me and Josh went fishing, and so I threw my pole out there, threw my anchor out there, caught a fish. Uncle Brandon, I want a pole like you got. Give me one of them lucky poles. Oh, okay. So I stepped into where the tackle box is at, where the reels are at, and when I stepped into it, this boat had two floors. And when I went to step into it, water's in the second floor. I was like, oh, man, I thought I had that problem fixed. And I, I didn't want to panic because Josh was a little boy at that time. So I, e, I ran over and pulled that anchor up. What are you doing, Uncle Brandon? I thought I was getting a lucky pole. <gasps> Not right now. We're going to make a quick move to the sandbar real quick like and I'm pulling it up. And I walk back there and look at the gas tanks. My dad's always told me if the gas tanks is floating, that's not good. I walk back there and they're floating. I'm like, oh, Lord. And so I boogied over to the sandbar, had a link phone, got a hold of my dad. He's up at the lock and dam. Thankfully, he comes down in his pontoon, and we're trying to get the water out of the boat. And see, that's why I mention that because, man, I am fearful. I know how to swim, and I'm fearful. My dad gets in the boat. He's like, we got to take it upstream. But every time you would go up, water would try to come in over the back of the boat. It was so full of water. And that water was swift that day, and my dad gets right out in the middle of the river, not towards the bank where we, you know, have a shorter place to swim, right out in the middle of the river. Long story short, when we went to load that boat up on the trailer, water started coming in on it, trying to sink the boat. And the reason I say that is because still today, the thing that may, means the most to me is that I made it out, but I still remember the water. Can I tell you, my life was filled with misery when I walked into the church house for the first time and I thought I was going under and I didn't think I'd make it, but I threw my trash on the altars and gave God every problem that brought me down. And I want to let you know, 17, 18 years later, he's brought me out. I don't even remember half of the stuff that I've been through. God is good. Amen. He's good, and I'm full of God today. I've chose. I've chose from that day forward not to allow the things that happens to me in my life to keep me from getting filled with God. This whole world fills their self full of all kind of crazy mess week after week after week. And they may mock at me and pick at me and whatever. Well, he's Mr. Holier Than Thou. Nope, I know that if it had not been for the Lord that brought me out of the stuff that I had put myself into, I know I'd be in hell today. So forgive me for loving him. Forgive me for praising him. Forgive me for going after him with all my heart because he's everything I got. Had it not been for the Lord that was on my side, I'd be in hell. And I want you to think about that today, friend, before we give the altar call today. What are you full of? You say, man, my boat's about to go on the preacher. I, I can't keep it up no more. Yeah? Well, if Christ is not on your boat, I, I would, I'd ask him to get on boat with me. Because one day there's going to come a storm that's going to last for eternity. And if Christ ain't on boat with you when that starts, he'll never be on boat with you. It's such an honor today, and I don't know how you feel, but it's such an honor today to know, I'm talking about know, that my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. Of all the other accomplishments God has done for me, I couldn't think of no greater joy than me knowing that God wrote my name in his book of life one Sunday morning. And today he still loves me. I love him. That's the thing because he's always loved me. But now he's put his love in my heart for him. I love him. He's everything. I want to stay full of him every day. How about you? So I'll stand over the building if we will today. I'd love to tell you if you came down here. That you wouldn't have to worry about going through those storms no more, but you just heard you, you're not going to be exempt.